Olá pessoal, boa tarde. Estamos aqui novamente agora com o episódio número 19 da websérie Mundo Empreendedor Expedição Israel. Estaremos aqui toda quinta, sempre a uma e meia com um convidado de peso, falando sobre os assuntos mais relevantes no ambiente de inovação e empreendedorismo aqui em Israel, um dos maiores polos tecnológicos do mundo. Eu sou Daniel Scaba, CEO da Ibitec, que tem aproximado esse rico ecossistema de inovação de vocês, do público brasileiro. Já estou aqui há quase 30 anos. Eu vivo inovação e tecnologia em todas as formas. Eu comecei na faculdade, passei pelo exército, trabalhei numa multinacional e agora estou aqui como empreendedor. Vamos agora mergulhar nesse mundo de inovação e empreendedorismo aqui com a Voito. E antes de chamar o nosso convidado especial de hoje, gostaria de chamar a nossa Bárbara, como sempre, para passar uns recados. Olá, Bárbara, tudo bem? Olá, Daniel, tudo ótimo. Bom, como o pessoal já está acostumado aqui, então, eu vim trazer alguns outros conhecimentos, materiais complementares, ações, tudo isso para vocês. Então, é, em primeiro lugar, eu queria dizer que o nosso manual de bordo já está recheadíssimo de materiais de todos os nossos outros episódios, né? A gente já tem 18 até aqui, então pensa quantos materiais, quantos insights a gente já não tem ali disponível. Então, se você não quer perder mais um só segundo de conhecimento, acesse agora o nosso manual. E para hoje, a gente tem também dois materiais complementares. O primeiro é um artigo falando sobre como ideias inovadoras podem se transformar em um grande negócio, né? as famosas startups. E também uma outra indicação, que é para vocês voltarem lá no comecinho do nosso quadro e assistirem também um episódio sobre food tech, que com certeza vai ser um, um excelente complemento para o nosso aprendizado de hoje. Além disso, né, convidar vocês a participarem, enviarem os seus comentários aqui, seguirem o nosso canal, já deixar o like no vídeo e também participar do nosso Insight Premiado, que para quem não conhece é uma ação bem massa que a gente faz. Basta você tirar um print da tela, postar no Instagram Stories, marcar o arroba Grupo Voito e colocar ali qual é o Insight que você gostaria de compartilhar. Fazendo isso, você já vai estar concorrendo e pode ganhar alguns mimos nossos. E no mais, a gente vai lá então, que eu estou muito ansiosa pelo nosso tema de hoje, Daniel. Maravilha, e ele vai ser demais mesmo. Obrigadíssimo, Bárbara. E agora, o nosso convidado. I'd like to invite Jason Rosenberg for a chat about the future of milk, the impact of innovation on milk production. Hello, Jason, how are you? Hi, Daniel. Nice to see you, and thank you for, for having me here. Really excited to talk about uh, Remilk and, and a little bit of how we view the future of, of milk. That's fantastic. Jason has a BA in law and an MBA, both by IDC Artilia here in Israel. Jason was a senior analyst in KPMG, and today he is the head of business development in Remilk. Before we start about Remilk and food tech, I would like to understand how you, Jason, came from USA, became a lawyer in Israel, and ended up as a head of business development in a startup. Can you please tell us a little bit this story? Yeah, uh, happily. And so I'll, I'll start by saying that I, I was born in the U.S. and uh, uh, born to a very Zionist family, uh, where both of my parents were always focused on Israel and uh, We spent a good amount of time when I was a kid uh, vacationing in Israel. And uh, at, at some point in, in the early 2000s, my family decided to, to make Aliyah and move to Israel uh, for good. And so I, I ended up here uh, during, during middle school. And uh, when it came time to choose what I wanted to study in university, I was, it was very clear to me that what I liked uh, most Uh, was negotiations and 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 sort of uh, setting up commercial uh, partnerships or sales of different types, uh, and I, I thought out what the best uh, pathway to get there would be, uh, and and once I realized that for me the ideal uh, education was was an MBA, I, I selected a a relevant bachelor that made sense, and to me uh, uh, legal studies made sense uh, where. I view MBA as sort of being a generalist and, uh, and law as being uh, uh, sort of uh, a, a specificist or, or, or sticking to the, to the details. 
Um, and I thought that those would complement each other well and, and have been really, really uh, pleased with, with the combination too. Uh, I, I think the best way to say how I ended up in my position today is, is like so many of the people around me in Israel, uh, it, it's, it's luck. Um, and, and it's really about, uh, you know, taking advantage of existing relationships and, 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 and hopping on opportunities. And uh, I, I had the uh, great opportunity to join Remilk about six months ago. Uh, to join uh, to join a friend who who founded the company, um, and and uh, uh, you know is, is a, just just excited to move out of the more corporate world into a, a mission driven startup. Um, yeah, that, that's that, uh, uh, be very interesting to hear about uh, Remilk. We know that food tech is something that is absolutely exploding in Israel around the world. The need for more uh, sustainable food, for more food, you know, the population growing, and uh, and the, the the plants where we today do it is not growing uh, in the same, you know, where it's limited. So uh, food tech is definitely one of the most exciting uh, themes uh, around the world in this uh, technology space. So uh, yeah, please tell us a little bit about Remilk. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll start by saying that I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with your general comment. I mean, the, the, the world is moving to a place where we need to find better solutions for food. Uh, and those better solutions on certain levels are health related, uh, but on, on most levels are really sustainability related and, uh, and just reality. Uh, we're growing at a pace faster than uh, we're able to produce food. And uh, currently, over 50% of the world's habitable land is used for, for animal agriculture to, to essentially produce our food. Um, and as the world population grows, uh, we, we're not finding more land and we still can't grow cattle on Mars. And so until we figure that out, we, we, we need other solutions. Um, Remilk is a milk uh, protein production company. And so uh, I, I'm sure that many of the viewers have heard the term alternative protein before, which is a big buzzword now uh, around the world. Uh, essentially, the proteins in milk are responsible for uh, the functionality of, of almost all dairy products. And so when we look at how cheeses are made or how yogurts are made, uh, the, the component in milk that gives uh, cheese that stretchiness or gives it uh, the spreadability or gives a yogurt its creaminess uh, is actually the protein itself. And so what Remilk is doing is producing the same protein that the cow produces, an identical protein, uh, but just in a more efficient way. Uh, the way that we do it is, is a process called precision fermentation, uh, which is uh, relatively similar to beer making. Uh, we actually, we take a, a microorganism, so like a bacteria or a yeast, uh, we insert into that uh, microorganism the DNA sequence from the cow that's responsible for, uh, for the production of a protein. And so you could call it a, a recipe uh, for that production. And, and then we feed that microorganism with sugar. And just like in the beer production process, that sugar would be turned to CO2 and alcohol. In our process, that sugar is turned into a protein. So uh, this is completely different from the soy-based milk, rice-based milk. This is actually milk. Absolutely, and and that's really what's so exciting about this is is you know we're, we're able to do with our protein what food producers can do with with the traditional protein. And so while while you or I have had plenty of almond milk and soy milk, um, I, I I don't think that anyone has had a quality almond mozzarella or a good uh, a, a good soy cream cheese and and we're able to produce the whole array of dairy products because our protein uh, acts the same as, as what the cow makes and the same uh, issues as people has to with uh, uh, resistance to lactose and so on they it, ha it will happen also in the milk thank you and, and, and so I'll, I'll actually take one step back if that's all right and, and, and just sort of look at what, what is milk, right? We, we hear this term milk a lot and, and milk is primarily made up of, of four different uh, components. One component, which is at least 85% of the product is water. And so we'll take water out of the equation because you can get water from other places. The last three components are the fat, the sugar, and the protein. Lactose is the sugar uh, and, and, and our whey or casein are the proteins. 
what we're doing is producing the protein. And so our products are actually lactose free because mm. we, we use sugars that come from plants and not from the animal, uh, which are not only easier for humans to consume, but they're actually significantly cheaper uh, and, and much more available around the world. And the, and the idea of real milk is actually just to produce the products based on milk or also we'll be able to drink uh, real milk. That will be one product uh, out of uh, your facility. Yeah, it's, it's, so that's actually another gr great question. And it's, it's, it's uh, one of the things that I think is less, uh, less clear to people when they think about our product initially. Um, the traditional dairy products are made by taking that milk breaking it down into all of its components and then repurposing those components into other products. And so they may isolate the fat from the milk and make butter with it, or may isolate the whey protein and make a ricotta cheese with it. Because we produce from the bottom up, uh, we, we actually, at, as of today, are able to produce about a third of the dairy products in the world with the products that we have ready for scaling. And over time, we'll be able to produce more products and eventually be able to make everything. But liquid milk will actually be probably one of the last products uh, because although nature produces it pretty simply, uh, it's, it's actually pretty complex and, and, and we need to make all of the components at the bottom level in order to funnel it up into milk. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. So the, the real milk actually, you produce milk for others, not for milk. This is it, very yeah, you, you could call it specialized milk, right? It's, yeah, it's, specialized it's the milk, milk that's ready for cheddar cheese or the milk that's ready for, for ice cream. So you're mentioning the protein a lot. And so the fat, you not produce the fat and eventually butter or also? Yeah, so, 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 so we are working on some fat uh, developments as well. But uh, for, for the most part, we, we're working with plant-based fats uh, with the understanding that, you know, a, a, a plain coconut fat or a plain palm oil are not good enough. Uh, and, and so we actually do uh, work on, on pretty complex uh, uh, techniques to take certain elements of different plant-based fats and combine them to provide a specific fat that we recommend using with our ice cream and a different fat that we recommend using with our sour cream. Um, and, and we're really able to find combinations of plant-based fats uh, that, that can really provide a, a, a very good experience. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about regulation, how the authorities are seeing such product? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that most of the viewers here are, are, are again, familiar with another term uh, or GMO or, or GM. Um, and it's, it's a word that scares a lot of people around the world, uh, right? It's, it's, it's essentially we're, we're taking something that's natural and changing it. Um, in, in our process, that first stage in which we put the DNA into a, uh, into a microorganism is, is modifying that organism, right? So we are creating a GMO. However, that GMO is responsible for the production of a protein that exists in nature. And that protein has no traces of the DNA from the GMO. So our claim is that we don't have a GMO product, we have a GMO process. Now, in the US, for example, uh, the FDA is, is pretty forward thinking on this and has agreed with our claim and, and has said that we are GMO free. We can market our product as GMO free and in terms of all of the health related elements, it, it, it is not a genetically modified product. There are certain other jurisdictions such as Europe uh, that, that, that are waiting. So EFSA, the, the food uh, security agency in, in Europe, is, is, is much more conservative and they, they would like to test our products over the course of several years before making a decision. Uh, so in terms of regulation, it's a very country by country basis um, with the first markets that are ready are, are, are the US uh, and actually Singapore, uh, which, which is also very, very interested in moving this type of technology forward. Uh, and there are some other countries that have uh, a added sort of interest because of their own local struggles, uh, like some of the Gulf states uh, near Israel, where, where in, in the desert, it's pretty hard to grow cat, uh, cattle. And so uh, they also have added incentive to, to uh, uh, approve this type of technology very quickly. That's very interesting. And uh, apparently it's the same what is happening with the cultured meat where uh, Singapore was the first country where uh, also approved it and FDA in, the, in Europe, they are uh, uh, different uh, views of that. 
And so let's hope that the, the Brazilian and visa will follow FDA and we'll be able to see uh, red milk very soon in Brazil also. Absolutely. Yes, we, 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 we really hope so. Brazil is a, uh, is, is a very exciting market for us. And uh, today you are talking about the cow milk, right? Uh, you are also looking for different types of milk, like sheep, goat, camel. So it's, it's actually a, a very interesting uh, uh, question. The majority of, of mammals produce uh, pretty much the same proteins. And the difference between their milk is, uh, is both in the composition of how much protein versus how much sugar versus how much fat. Uh, and, and in addition to those, it's, it's um, uh, which, which enzymes and which other minerals are, are apparent in the, uh, in the product that give it its flavoring. And so we can actually produce a, a goat milk product using our protein, uh, which, which is just uh, uh, achieved by adding a different bacterial culture uh, in the last stage of, of the cheese making process, for example. Um, so in, in essence, it's, it's the same protein, just different flavoring agents that are added to it. Um, and, and the same is true for, for most uh, different mammals. I, I should say that occasionally I speak with a company in some far area of the world that asks me if we make camel milk products or asks me if we make uh, seal milk products. And, and, and I should say that we don't have experience with all of them, <laughs> but, but we've, we, we've tried a, a good deal of them and, and, and uh, it's, it's really applicable, yeah. And of course, the next question is, what about human uh, milk? Uh, if that you're able to do it in terms of technology, but also I know that regulatory is a different story, but uh, let's talk about uh, the technology first. Uh, is it possible to do it? Yeah, so you, you, you actually hit it right on the dot because uh, t technologically it's, it's very doable. Um, however, it's regulated in most of the world as a pharmaceutical ingredient and not as food. And so that process of getting it approved is, is much, much longer. Uh, in, in addition, uh, there are more restrictions on us in terms of quality requirements for the production. And so while we produce at a food grade, pharmaceutical grade is even one higher. Um, and, and, and so uh, we, we are working on certain applications of the sort, um, but I'd say it's, it's in the long pipeline of probably another, you know, maybe seven to 10 years until until we're able to, to actually sell a baby formula. Interesting. Uh, I understand that you are going through a, a big round of investment. So can you tell a little bit about the, the story, the goal of this current round, but also the previous rounds, how you grow as, as a company? Sure, absolutely. And so uh, I, I, I'll apologize ahead of time if I'm at all vague. Uh, because we'll, we'll share a lot of this information in, in the coming weeks, uh, uh, actually, with the public. But uh, we are currently finalizing our Series B uh, funding round, uh, which is a ver very, very large uh, nine-figure uh, U.S. dollar round um, that, that's aimed at really scaling our, uh, our production. And so uh, the company was founded several years ago. Uh, last year, we completed our Series A round of $11.8 million uh, that, that went to really uh, uh, expanding our personnel. And so the company uh, jumped, uh, about tripled itself in size over the last six months. Uh, and, and in addition to that, we established a, a really state-of-the-art uh, R&D lab, uh, as well as initial production capabilities. And so we can produce uh, uh, large enough quantities to send our, our, our customers. We're able to, uh, to actually work on some joint, uh, joint developed products with them. Uh, but in order to properly commercialize the product, we really need to scale the production even further. And so uh, what we've done is raise the sum of money uh, in, in order to do so. And so that's that, that uh, today we leverage uh, uh, certain manufacturing partners around the world uh, to actually produce the protein for us using their existing uh, uh, facilities, which to date have produced using very, very similar technology, uh, pharmaceutical ingredients and enzymes. And we're, we're essentially transforming those, uh, those production lines from uh, the production of very high value, low volume products like a therapeutic protein uh, to the production of a very large scale, low volume product like milk protein. And so uh, over the next several years, I think that we'll all see uh, several companies like Remilk, including Remilk, 
uh, uh, working to expand our capacity and our own controlled capacity in, in order to really, you know, sort of sort of beat that hurdle uh, uh, in the next few years. This is very interesting in terms of strategy where maybe the majority of startups, they, they only focus on the technology itself and some sort of uh, license the technology and you decided to build uh, your own uh, facility and you have to jump in terms of uh, investment to uh, over $100 million of investment and so on. So it's very interesting. Uh, can, you, can you tell a little more about the strategy that you want to go this step further and also get into the, the production itself and not only license the technology? Yeah, so I, I think there's, there's several factors that, that you know, sort of drive that strategic decision. Um, I would say that the first overlying factor, and it's something that I think is interesting if we take a step out and look at the Israeli startup ecosystem as a whole, uh, th there's been a trend over the last several years where Israeli startups traditionally would establish this great technology and then look to exit, right? Th their initial uh, strategy was always sell to Intel, sell to IBM, uh, and, and, and get out as early as you can uh, and, and pocket that money and go fund another startup and, and, and try to get that one to $100 million and sell it and, and move on. Over the last few years, we've seen Israeli companies actually uh, uh, go more towards IPOs uh, in the U.S. primarily and then remain in Israel as uh, Israel-based large multinational uh, uh, organizations. Um, I, I'll say that as, a, as an Israeli citizen, um, I'm very pleased with this. I mean, without, without nothing to do with my personal uh, job at the moment, I think it's a phenomenal thing for our economy. I think it's a great thing uh, for our ecosystem in general uh, to have large multinationals based here. Uh, and, and I think that that's probably a factor leading into our mindset as well is, you know, sort of the ecosystem is changing and shifting that way. Uh, but I'd, I'd say that the main the main thing that's driving us is is, is our mission. And so uh, Remilk is a mission-driven company that's really focused on changing the way that dairy is produced and, and essentially changing the way that food is produced. Uh, we view our best way of being able to do so uh, as, as producing a high-quality ingredient on our own, leveraging our knowledge and our experience, uh, and stopping at that stage. So we're, we're a B2B company. We're looking to provide our ingredient to the large dairy companies of the world uh, to produce with. And so, you know, I, I think we're sort of in between, right? We're not, we're not looking to, 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 uh, uh, license our technology, but we're also not looking to, to sell a finished product to a consumer. Um, and, and that way I think we can also access as large a population as possible, service as large a population as possible, make an impact, uh, and, and really, you know, make a local impact to create Israeli jobs and, 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 and Israeli yes. products. Very interesting what you mentioned. Yeah, yeah I, I already heard the term that the Israel is moving from a startup nation to a scale-up nation, which yeah. is exactly this trend that you are mentioning in the last few years. Very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I, we got some uh, questions from uh, our audience, Jason, and one mm -hmm. of them is exactly this trend of uh, sustainability. We know that uh, there's a major impact in the greenhouse gas emission coming from livestock. So uh, you see that uh, this uh, is one of the reasons that we will see more and more companies like Remilk in the world? Yeah, a a absolutely. And so, I mean, I, th I think that if we look at sort of the, the timeline of, of our development over the next several years, the primary driving factor for us today is probably uh, uh, the vegan and animal free uh, consumers, right? It's, it, it's, it's a consumer mindset of wanting to refrain from eating animals, primarily because of animal cruelty, uh, not, not only, but primarily, and some sometimes it's health driven as well. Over the next several years, we actually expect the primary driver to be environmental or, or sustainability related. And so it's, it's different governments around the world that have started to either put uh, uh, added tariffs or penalties on, on companies or industries that are, that are doing more harm to the globe than good, uh, and actually providing incentives to those companies who are doing more good than harm uh, to continue what they're doing and scale up their production. Uh, so, for example, the, the, these can be tax incentives. These can be certain financing incentives as well uh, that, that Israel is at the forefront of providing in the world. Uh, but I should mention is not the only one. Um, there are really lots of governments in the world that are very interested in advancing um, 
you know, ESG positive initiatives. Um, I think in the long run, and this is sort of the, you know, the interesting and the cool part of this and why there's a lot of private interest in addition to the public interest is that, you know, we can sort of leverage the, the animal free uh, 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 drive and the sustainability or environmental drive to, to fund and scale our current operations to the point where we're actually able to be more economic than the cow as well. And so it's it, it's sort of, you know, we, we get to use this added benefit right now to in, in several years time actually be able to be much cheaper uh, than, than a cow is at producing dairy uh, and, and really, you know, in, in that way attract everyone. Yeah, that's a very interesting point that I've seen also in the culture meal uh, meat uh, company saying that uh, at some point that will be more sustainable, they will be more healthy, they will be cheaper, they will be tastier. So actually you have all the company, all the components to say, okay, the old way of doing things is obsolete because there's nothing there that uh, yeah. maybe also only the romantic part of it to, to cow a cow, but to milk a cow, but, uh, but part of that, all the other uh, components are, uh, you know, these new technologies will actually replace them. Absolutely. And, and I'd, I'd add maybe even that that's a, you know, it's a, it's a very important tipping point. Uh, it, if we look, you know, on, on a, uh, uh, an ethical level of what we're doing, you know, there, there, there's one value in providing a, a better solution for the wealthy. Uh, there's another value in providing a, a positive solution for, for humanity as a whole and for the globe as a whole. And I think that, you know, with, without speaking on, on too large terms and sounding like we're really, you know, about to change the world, but we believe we are, um, you know, it, it, it's in the early years, there are only certain countries and certain populations that can afford to pay a little bit more in order to achieve a better goal. Right, and that's environmental or or or, or uh, uh, you know animal welfare. In the long term, we hope that we can provide our proteins, and we believe that we can, to developing nations as well, to lower income uh, uh, populations too, and 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 that's when the real impact is made. Um, no, no. Fantastic. This is the excellent way to, to finish this interview. Jason, I'd like to thank you so much for being with us, enlightening us, inspiring us, and we hope to soon we'll be able to eat a cheese and uh, and butter made by real milk in Brazil. So th thank you so much. Th th thank you, Daniel. Always a pleasure. And if I can just say one, one last thing, I, I'd, I'd really like to openly extend an invite to anyone uh, on this uh, who, who does arrive in Israel, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, in, in, in some way and or, or to Remilk in general. And we're always happy to host people here and show them around. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, like the other companies in our industry, uh, we're all very proud of the work that we're doing and really excited to share it with, with, with anyone who's interested in seeing it. Fantastic. And uh, so I, I will enlarge this invitation. You can also reach out to me so we can both uh, go out to a bar and drink a milk. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. E aí, Bárbara, como é que foi esse bate-papo com o Jason, Bárbara? Foi incrível, Daniel. Nossa, eu estava ouvindo aqui, cada coisa que ele ia falando também ia me lembrando bastante do nosso episódio sobre food tech, né, que a gente fez lá no comecinho. Lá no comecinho. Então, foi muito legal ver essa relação, né, porque ele falou bastante que, basicamente, ali é o uso da proteína do leite para poder construir outros alimentos, enfim, derivados e tudo mais. Então, eu achei muito interessante, né? Como que a gente pode pegar um elemento natural e é, tirando, né? Dissecando ali todas as proteínas e depois com essa proteína voltar e construir um outro elemento, né? E com isso a gente também ajuda bastante a, a natureza, a esse cons consumo, assim, né? Dos, dos itens naturais. Então, eu achei muito interessante... E realmente vi essa relação muito forte com o nosso episódio anterior. Eu achei interessante também ele falando sobre estratégia né, do negócio. Então, aqui no finalzinho também, ele falou bastante sobre os investimentos e tudo mais. E que eles são focados assim, no propósito. né? Então, 
por mais que a empresa esteja se desenvolvendo, alcançando voos maiores, eles sabem também qual é o limite que eles querem alcançar, né? Então, ele até comentou aqui que, a princípio, o propósito deles não é chegar no consumidor final de uma vez, né? Produzir esse produto final. Eles querem fazer parte dessa cadeia. Então, é muito interessante como eles têm esse propósito muito claro, né? Isso é muito importante em qualquer tipo de negócio. E uma outra parte da estratégia que eu achei interessante também era quando ele estava falando ali dos organismos geneticamente modificados, né? Que eles fazem essa modificação porque eles utilizam a proteína de, um, de algo natural, mas, ao mesmo tempo, eles consideram isso um processo modificado, né? E não um produto final. Então, achei interessante também como que essa visão, muitas vezes, também pode mudar a forma como o consumidor vê aquilo. Então, isso pode transformar também o, o seu mercado, né? Deixar ele um pouco mais é, favorável também ao seu produto, entendendo um pouquinho melhor como funciona aquele processo. Não, sem dúvida. É realmente inspirador e, e, e como você falou, né? Tivemos aquela conversa lá atrás com o Jonathan Berger sobre a incubadora de food tech. Agora a gente já viu um exemplo e temos, e temos muitas. E, e realmente essa, essa visão final que o Jason nos trouxe que a gente vai chegar num ponto onde que a carne cultivada, o leite cultivado vai ser mais ético, mais sustentável, mais barato, mais gostoso, mais saudável. Então, realmente, a gente vai chegar num ponto onde a gente vai poder realmente ter alimentos é, que vai fazer sentido para toda a população e mesmo os que têm alguma visão, não, não como porque é derivado de, de animais, eu não quero, questões é, éticas vão começar a diminuir. E aí as conversas vão ser outras, como você mesmo tocou, o assunto das, dos geneticamente modificados, opa, calma aí, como é que eu vejo isso, como que eu me relaciono com isso? Mas é, realmente é um assunto que me encanta e, e que está em crescimento e em transformação. Foi ótimo a gente terminar esse penúltimo episódio dessa temporada com esse bate-papo com o Jason. Concordo totalmente, Daniel. E, pessoal, é... eu queria agradecer vocês novamente por estarem aqui com a gente nesse bate-papo com o Jason sobre o leite cultivado, como, como está sendo desenvolvido todo esse caminho de food tech. E, na semana que vem, teremos mais um convidado de peso. Vamos estar aqui com o Shaul Chachua, que é o presidente da Ibitec, meu querido sócio, meu querido amigo. E vamos analisar toda essa temporada, esses 19 episódios, vamos olhar todos os detalhes que a gente passou durante esse ano inteiro. Então, não percam, semana que vem, o último episódio dessa temporada com o Shaul para uma análise de tudo que a gente viu. Um abraço grande e até lá. <música>